Okay, um, shall we start? Yeah, welcome to the exercise class. So today the two topics we'll discuss first the um, equality version of Landau's principle for coherent setting, which we already saw in the lecture when we just have a system S and machine M, and then we perform um, unitaries on that on a joint system. And the second we will be closer to the um, to what we look at in thermodynamics and classical thermodynamics when we have Carnot engines. So we'll have the system, the hot bath, and a cold bath, and we'll do operations on on them. But first, uh, and then second, we'll look at the uh, how we can prove the second law, or more like the probabilistic sec uh, version of the second law, because we, when we talk about quantum systems, we talk, can talk only about um, average energies extracted, and how we can prove that uh, using a simple entropic argument. Uh, okay, so let us start with a Landau principle and the coherent setting. So what we mean by coherent setting is that we don't, um, we don't model work explicitly in this setting. So we only have uh, two parts of our global system, which is the system S, the target system, and the machine M. And machine is um, coupled to a bath at the temperature beta, and it is a thermal state at temperature beta. And it has a Hamiltonian HM. So the joint state of these two um, systems initially is separable, so they're not, they're not correlated, so we just rho s times the product rho m, which is the thermal state. So we just write this as this. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we're looking at the physical settings, so we assume that beta is bigger or equal than zero. Um, then let us use the following notation. So the final state of the system we label as it our rho prime SM, which is the result of applying some unitary on the initial state of the system. And I label the reduced states of the systems S and M as rho S prime and rho M prime. So these are the described by the partial trace. Um, okay, uh, a bit more notation that we're gonna use in our um, deriving our equalities and inequalities. Um, so which, which come from information theory. So the first one is the mutual information. Uh, which you, I hope, remember from the quantum information theory course or elsewhere. So uh, the mutual information between systems S and M on the state rho S M prime is equal to the entropy of uh, rho S prime plus the entropy of rho M prime minus the entropy of the joint states. And uh, due to sub-additivity uh, property of Feynman entropy, uh, the mutual information is always uh, bigger or equal to zero. So intuitively, if you remember from QIT course, this is um, this can be seen from the fact that when we when we take the reduced states of the system, we erase all information about their correlations. So, um, in some sense, this the joint state contains more information because it also contains the information about correlations. 
So uh, subsequently, the entropy of the joint state would be less than the sum of individual entropies. Okay, and final is the relative entropy that we're going to use. And relative entropy, we label it as D between the states, let's say, rho m prime and rho m. And it is defined as the trace of um, rho m prime logarithm rho m prime uh, minus trace of rho m prime logarithm of rho m. So, yeah, so here we just compare um, two states, two different states of a, of a system. Okay. Oh, can everybody see the marker, or is it a bit off? It's okay? Okay, just let me know if it's, if it's not very well. Okay, and uh, so not to keep you in the dark about this, so basically, let me first outline what we want to prove. So for, for this coherent setting, we want to prove the following theorem that beta trace hm rho m prime minus rho m uh, minus the difference, the inverse difference in entropy so the decrease in entropy um, equals the mutual information on the final state plus the relative entropy between the, the final and the initial states of the machine. And, ah, and one thing I forgot to mention, uh, relative entropy uh, also has the um, the property that it's always positive or equal to zero. This you should also have seen in the QIT course, I think. Okay, so this is what we want to prove um, for the coherent setting. Uh, and from the positivity of both of this um, measures, we get that this is big, bigger or equal to zero, from which um, if, you, if you note that this is exactly the change of energy for the machine, uh, the Landau's principle follows. Just need to uh, shuffle around the beta. Okay, so now let us start proving. And to do so, let us first consider the lemma. Actually, I don't like this marker myself because I cannot see myself when I write, which is funny, but yeah, much better. Um, so we first prove the lemma, which I think you saw in a lecture already. So the lemma is um, the following. So, If I take the difference, um, the change of entropy of the system S plus the change of entropy on the system M, um, this is equal to the mutual information on the final states. Okay, this is trivial to prove because what we need to do, we just need to take the definition of the mutual information. So if I take the definition of mutual information on the final state, what I get is the entropy on the final state minus, sorry, here it's minus and plus the entropy um, 
on the marginals. Uh, because what we perform, uh, because what we perform on the system is a unitary, um, the unitaries do not change the entropy of the system. Uh, is that clear to everyone? Okay. Uh, yeah, quick explanation is because unitaries don't change the eigenvalues and you can just write out the entropy as the sum of eigenvalues or log eigenvalues. Uh, and so basically then it means that S of rho SM prime is equal to S of rho SM. However, um, if we take the state rho SM, rho SM is separable. So it's rho S tensor product rho M which means that its entropy can be written just the sum of entropies of its parts. This, is, this should also be intuitive. And hence what I get is this, these two uh, terms which stay, and I also need to subtract this term, which is the sum of S of rho M yeah, and S of rho S. So indeed, what I get is um, that the mutual information is the sum of the difference of changes in the entropies on the systems S and M. Okay, so the next Using this, I'm going to prove the statement up there. Um, okay. So, to do so, I think first, not to, um, in order to not to confuse you, uh, first what I'm going to do, I'm going to re, I'm going to take the relative entropy and rewrite it in, um, in a bit of a different way. I think that should help. Uh, so it will be more clear. So relative entropy, which is up there, between these two states. Um, so the first term in the relative entropy is just the um, entropy of the system uh, rho m prime. And the second term is a bit more annoying, but I'll keep it as it is. Um, except for one thing. So basically, yes. Uh, one thing, this, this term we can also massage. Uh, why? Because we know that the initial state of the machine uh, rho m is a thermal state at the temperature uh, beta, which means that I can massage the second term uh, by just inserting there the definition of this thermal state. So I'm going to be minus trace rho m prime, which is not necessarily a thermal state, uh, and logarithm of the initial state of the machine, which is can be written as this. Okay. Uh, so, how can I massage it further? So the first term stays. Then in the second term, I just apply, I just open up this logarithm. So I express it as uh, logarithm of this term minus logarithm of this term. And what I get, ah, sorry. So nobody uh, noticed that. So I made, made a mistake. It must be minus s because the entropy is defined as minus trace of this. Uh, okay. So here we have trace rho m prime um, logarithm of minus, sorry, logarithm of e to the power minus beta hm plus uh, 
here we would have plus trace of rho m prime um, trace e to the power minus beta hm. Okay, so here uh, in this expression, trace of e to the power minus beta hm is just a number, I can take it out. And I'm, um, I'm left only with a trace of rho m prime, which is by definition one, because rho m prime is a density matrix. And here, uh, instead of this logarithm, uh, I can just write minus beta hm, because when we take the logarithm with e to the power minus beta hm, also by definition, we should get minus beta hm. So as a result, it means that this is equal to um, minus, yeah, so minus, minus s of rho m prime plus uh, trace plus beta trace rho m prime hm uh, plus this weird trace, ah, okay, sorry, this is, um, it's going to be a log here as well. So it's going to be log of trace. Yeah, because here it comes from opening up this logarithm. It's going to be plus trace of logarithm. So trace can go away, actually, because it's just a number. Plus logarithm trace of e to the power minus beta hm. Okay, so the idea is that going through this calculation, assuming that the initial state of the machine is a thermal one, we can rewrite the, um, the relative entropy in that way. So we're gonna use it just now. Um, <clears throat> now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the lemma. And from the lemma, we can uh, we can just simply write the difference, <coughs> sorry, the difference in the entropy of the system S, sorry, of, this, oh, of, the, of the machine. So we have this minus this equals to um, the mutual information plus um, the entropy of rho s minus the entropy of rho s prime. So the entropy of the system s before and minus the entropy of the system s after. Okay, now um, let us do again the same thing as we did before. Um, namely, we're gonna use the fact that rho m is a is a thermal state. If rho m is a thermal state, we can write its entropy um, more explicitly. So what is the entropy here? It's going minus trace of rho m, logarithm of rho m. This is gonna be minus trace. I just input the definition of um, the thermal state, but I only input it in, in the logarithm. Here I can just keep it rho m for simplicity. Here I get e to the power minus beta hm over the trace. Okay, now we will do the same thing as we did there. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna separate the, the division in the logarithm. So we write it as the minus trace rho m logarithm of e to the power of minus beta hm um, plus trace of rho m logarith uh, logarithm of trace of e to the power of minus beta hm. 
Um, okay, so here again, this is minus beta hm. And hence, I can write that this is um, beta. So minus here goes away. We're just left with beta trace hm rho m uh, plus trace. Um, so, OK, so the second term we massage again as we did it up there. Um, this is just a number, I take it out, I'm left with trace of row m, which is 1. So I'm simply left with this number, which is log of trace of e to the power minus beta hm. OK, uh, is it until now clear how, how this calculation goes? OK, I see nodding heads. Uh, very good. Then I come back to that lemma, and now I just input what I found for um, S of rho m. So what I get is S of rho m prime. Minus um, beta trace hm rho m minus log of trace of e to the power minus beta h uh, equals s of rho s minus s of rho s prime um, plus the mutual information. OK. Uh, now, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to use that expression I have for relative entropy. And I'm going to say that from that expression, uh, it's clear that s of rho m prime minus log of trace of e to the power minus beta hm equals to uh, so yeah, beta trace rho m prime hm uh, minus the relative entropy. Okay, so did I make a mistake somewhere? It's very possible. Um, let me just check the signs. Um, so here it seems to be correct. Okay, here it's correct. Um, here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, wait, but it stays on this side, right? Because here it's the minus. Okay, so uh, let me think again. So we're gonna, we need this. Is we have, do we have minus here? Or did I mess up something? Okay, this is definitely correct. Um, then I should have messed up that thing. Means, okay, here's the plus. 
loss feature. So, so yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, sorry, just give me a second. It's going to be this. So S of row M prime be this. So this is going to be, yeah, when I did it at home, I did it a bit different way, but then I thought maybe I should start with like, um, opening up the expression for relative entropy, because if I don't do that, it becomes a bit messy. Um, okay. So let's see. Ah, oh, wait, everything is okay, right? Yeah, all good. Sorry for your confusion. Um, anyway, so here, this minus this, I just substitute that. So we go, if we get is beta trace rho m prime hm uh, minus the relative entropy. Um, minus this term um, equals this difference in entropy for the system S plus the mutual info. Yeah, it's all good. Somehow I mis messed up in my head like what I did with the relative entropy, but yeah, it seems all to be fine. Uh, then indeed, what we get in the end is the desired expression just here. So we, we just um, yeah, group this and this term. So we get trace of hm rho m prime minus rho m. Uh, equals to or like, let's say minus this entropy change. Uh, equals to the sum of the relative entropy. And the mutual information, which are, as I said, both positive. So this is bigger or equal than zero. So basically, for example, which means that if you want to decrease the entropy of the system, system S, then on the amount of energy that you need to extract uh, from the machine, sorry, you need to add, you need to, to do on the machine um, is lower bounded by that um, change in the entropy. because this term is exactly the change of the energy in, of the machine. Okay, so this was um, a coherent setting. If everything is clear how we, do, how we derive things in this coherent setting and come to that inequality and Moreover, we come to the equality, right? Now we can um, express this exact difference uh, trade-off between the energy of the machine and the uh, change in entropy of the system as the sum of the mutual information and the relative entropy. Uh, and then come to the usual inequality form. So if, if all, all of this is clear, I'll go to the, yes.
Um, okay, so how do I, I mean, this is just one of the ways to quantify kind of the difference, in this case, informational difference between two states, right? Yes, that's that's one way. Um, but here, here you can see that. So, for example, if you take um, so yeah, sorry, I need to think about this. I don't remember now exactly, but yeah, I'll try to maybe see in a break, and then I'll come back to you. Um, okay, so if, if this is all clear, maybe I'll just continue writing here. Um, I'll come to the what we call an incoherent setting. So in an incoherent setting, as I said, it's closer to the usual thermodynamic settings that we consider. Um, it's a Carnot machine. Aside from the system, we have also a hot bath and a cold bath. And then and there we will see that we also can formulate a sort of a bound. Um, now on the change in the free energy of the system, which will also uh, include the, uh, the efficiency of the Carnot engine. So first I'll, I'll just explain the setting and notation, then I'll state the result, and I'll explain how, how the result is related to the um, Landauer's limit. When we're like, in which limit the result will give you the Landau's limit. And then we, I'll just briefly go through the derivation. So. Um, yeah, so. I forgot to mention, so this exercise is partially based um, on a paper which is referenced in the exercise sheet. Um, don't read the whole paper. This is just a few lemmas from that. And then from their results. Okay, so the incoherent setting. I again have the system, S, and then I again have the machine, but now the machine and split is into, into two parts. Um, the one that I label as R, which is the cold bath, and H, which is a hot bath. Uh, the cold bath is coupled to, uh, to reservoir at a temperature beta r, and hot bath is initially coupled to reservoir at a temperature beta h. And they both start in their respective thermal states. And we know that, of course, the temperature of the hot bath is bigger than the temperature of the cold bath, which means that their inverse temperatures are the other way around. And so the notation I will use will be the following. So first the joint state, the initial joint state is such that um, the states are again separable on all three systems. Uh, so it's rho s tends the product of the state on the on the, say, on the cold bath, which is a thermal state, and the cold bath has a Hamiltonian HR, 
and tensor product the state on the hot bus, which is a thermal state at the temperature beta H with the Hamiltonian uh, HH. Okay, again, there is a final state after we perform some unitary. And the unitary, as usual, is energy preserving. So it commutes with a total Hamiltonian. Okay. Um, and then I'll use the notation of, like, I'm just going to label as delta S on some system as the um, change of the entropy on this system. So prime minus rho S of rho. Um, then same for the energy change. Hamiltonian of a particular system, rho prime minus rho. And uh, finally, uh, the, the free energy of the system at the temperature beta. which is defined as the energy of the system minus one over beta entropy of the system. I mean, subsequently, the delta F would be the delta E on the system minus one over beta delta S on the system. So this is the usual free energy you saw in thermodynamics or statfys, which is E minus Ts. Okay. Uh, so, and what we want to show is the following. So we want to prove that the cha minus change of the entropy of the system S at temperature beta R minus eta that I forgot. So eta is the cardinal efficiency of the engine uh, if the engine would have a cold bath at the temperature beta R and the hot bath at the temperature beta H, which this is... Um, the result, you know, from thermodynamics, but it's going to come up here as well. So uh, this is 1 minus beta H over beta R. So just remember, again, beta is in the inverse temperature, so we just switch them accordingly. So to continue here, we have minus F, difference of the free energy on the system S, minus eta, Delta E, the hot bath, equals to 1 over beta R. Here we have change of entropy on the system S, change of entropy on the system R, change of entropy on the system H, plus the relative entropy... <laughs> For, um, for the cold part of the machine plus the relative entropy for the hot part of the machine. Uh, and one can show that um, this, this expression is also always positive. Uh, so first, just before the in the last four minutes before the break, let me explain how does this result relate to Landau's principle. So basically, um, if we throw away this equality result, which is very nice, um, and just use the inequality, what we get is that the change of the 
free energy on the system S minus eta uh, change of energy on the hot bath is bigger or equal than zero, uh, which means that if we're extracting the energy from the hot bath um, and inputting the energy into the, into the cold bath, then basically uh, delta EH minus delta EH is just modulus delta EH because in the usual Carnot engine, that's what we do, right? We extract the energy from the, uh, from the hot bath. And then basically what we get is that the eta modulus delta EH would be bigger or equal than delta F S at beta R. So here you already can see some uh, shadow of the bound, as in uh, you see of, of the usual Landau's bound. You see that the, um, the heat extracted, um, which we need to extract from the hot bath, is lower bounded by the change of the free energy of the system S. So uh, to, to exactly uh, see how the Landauer's bound arises from here, let us just take um, and express the change of the, um, of the energy of the hot bath in terms of the changes of the energy in the cold bath and the system. Since the overall in the system, the energy is conserved, this means that uh, delta EH plus delta ER plus delta ES is zero. Okay, so now I just input it there and then I get that eta uh, delta ER plus delta ES um, bigger or equal than delta FS at, the, at beta R, which is equal to delta ES. Uh, minus one over beta R um, delta S on the system S. Okay, now I just input the, uh, the eta here. So what I get is one minus uh, beta H over beta R um, delta ER plus delta ES, bigger or equal than delta ES minus one over beta R delta SS. Okay, if we massage this equation, so first I will multiply everything by beta R, and then I get beta R delta ER plus delta ES minus beta H delta ER plus delta ES bigger or equal than beta R delta ES minus delta SS. Okay, and from this we can conclude that delta SS minus beta H delta ER plus beta R minus beta H uh, delta EH, sorry, delta E A, is this correct? Yes. Delta ER. Okay, so this term cancels. Uh, delta S goes there. You're left with. So, sorry, this is uh, the beta R delta ER, beta H delta, yes. Beta H delta ES, yes, okay. 
No, it's good. Uh, minus beta a else delta e s plus beta r minus beta h delta e r or is bigger or equal than zero. Um, just just looking by the at this equation, can can anyone tell me in which limit? Um, so for example, what temperature of the hot bath we need to take for it to become a Landauer's limit? Which is the usual Landauer's limit I've seen before. So for example, what happens if I take the bath, hot bath at infinitely hot temperature? So to which, to which beta h that would correspond? Yes. So if I take T hot infinity, this would mean beta H zero. Um, and then all this, this, this would go, this would also go, and we will be left with delta SS is bigger, uh, so plus beta R delta ER is bigger or equal than zero. So there is a there is again this trade-off between the change of entropy and how much what is the what, how the the energy of the cold bath changes. So this is was basically to relate uh why to to show why this this result also is a form of Landauer's bound. Okay, I think now we we do a break and we meet at uh, five to one. If there are any questions, please come and ask. So before I continue with a sketch of the proof, since there was a question about relative entropy, um, so, I mean, relative entropy as it's used, it's also used in the classical information theory and also for describing the differences between different probability distributions. And basically, uh, for example, the explanation that is given in Wikipedia for that is that the interpretation of this divergence is that uh, is the uh, basically the number the average difference in the number of the bits required for encoding samples of one distribution using um, the original distribution or the, using the encoding for the second distribution. And yeah, that's the difference. I'm not sure exactly how that uh, translates into its uh, physical meaning for uh, for the physical states and quantum systems, but generally it's just used as a, yeah as a metric on the space of probability distributions. And I guess as as the entropy is extendable to um, as the entropy is extendable to the space of quantum systems as well, this also extends there. Um, okay, so we sketched this. Now let me ske quickly sketch the proof and then I'll go to the final part because we also need to discuss the simple version of seeing why the second law holds. So we erase here. Okay, so I'll just catch the idea and I advise you to go through the, using this hints, to go through the proof yourself. Uh, so basically the first thing that we're gonna use is um, that in fact, we're gonna use that again if we take the mutual information and now, now mutual information on all three uh, systems on the final state. So this is defined as 
again, the same thing. So the sum of the entropies on the marginals. Sum of M R plus S of rho H prime minus the entropy of the joint state. Um, from this, for the same reasons, the, uh, the mutual information on two systems is always positive. Here is also always positive because, again, none of these entropies contain information bits about the correlation between two systems. Um, it's all in that state. And, uh, yeah, this is proved, again, due to subadditivity of entropy. And we also know that uh, the initial state is separable, which means, again, we can write this entropy of the joint state equal to the entropy of the, of the initial state because it was, un again, it was only unitary and entropy does not change under the unitary. And this is just a sum of entropies on individual systems. Which means that this mutual information, I'll just write I, can be written as the sum of the entropy changes on each individual system. Okay? Um, so when we were proving the part B, uh, we could see that, in fact, we can express the change on, of the entropy on the individual system. So what we had in B, we just had one machine. Um, and then we could write that change of energy all multiplied by the beta m minus the relative entropy um, equals to the change of entropy. So was, this was just from, uh, from B. Now I'm, I'm going to use this result from B, and we're going to write it for R, and also we can write it for H. So we write it for the hot and, and the cold bath. So RH and RH. And then we're going to input these into this expression. And um, after inputting this in this expression, instead of delta um, delta SS, we're going to express it through the free energy. So this is the next step. After this, delta SS, we can express it as um, yeah, delta F beta R uh, of the system S like a some function. Um, and then basically just use the non-negativity of mutual info and um, relative entropy. So this should be fairly straightforward. Just input these results of B into, into this expression and um, yeah, just, just write it out and get that result. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, um, I'm not gonna go through this proof. If, if you're struggling with it, then um, just look at the solutions. Okay, so now we have um, we have seen this Landauer's limit and uh, 
coherent and incoherent settings, both for when we just have one machine and also when we have the hot on a cold bath. Uh, very good. Now let us go to the second part, which is about the second law. So second law is, as you know, a fundamental law in thermodynamics. Uh, and it can be proved in classical thermodynamics. Uh, and it also can be proved and shown in quantum thermodynamics as well. I'm sorry. Okay, in classical thermodynamics, it's it's rather postulated. Uh, if you take phenomenological um, formulations, but here we can actually kind of derive it. Um, contradiction. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take a setting which has um, a bath B and a weight system W. And about weight system you already heard in a lecture. So this is kind of a system which we can use as work storage. You can also think about the system as a battery where you can just um, um, lower and lower or elevate its levels, energy levels, depending on whether you do work using it or you do work on it. And we're gonna have some assumptions uh, that we put uh, on this weight system. So, yeah, see, second law. So we have a bath, of the uh, weight system W. You can see it as a battery with a lot of energy levels. Okay, and these, there are some assumptions that we need to um, postulate for the system W. So the first assumption is that, um, so the average work um, that is done on the, um, in the protocol, in a particular protocol, shouldn't depend on what is the initial state of this weight system. So, so basically, um, given a protocol, um, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter what is the initial state of this weight. I should always get uh, the same average work. And the second assumption, which in principle can be connected to the first, is that all out unitaries on these two systems uh, should commute with the translation operator on this weight, which we label as gamma A, so gamma A, uh, where gamma A is, say that if we act with it on the state zero of the weight, then I get state A on the weight. So it's just a translation operator for the states of the weight. Uh, so one can come up with um, several reasons why we put these assumptions on the weight. Um, I'm gonna tell you one of them and at home, you can think about others as well. So one, one very important um, property of the weight that we want to have, especially keep in mind that this is, an, um, this is you, can, you can try to think about the analogy to the battery, is that we want to reuse this weight. So we want to be able to reuse this weight for different protocols. Um, and 
we don't want to for the result of the protocol to be dependent on on the initial state of the weight for example so it's like the battery right it doesn't matter in which uh, in which device you plug it in um, it should always work uh, equally well so and also Ralph was I think uh, also explaining some uh, properties of the weight why they're important but I will not go into that now uh, use okay uh, and then maybe there are more so uh, how are we going to prove the second law using this construction so from the thermodynamics maybe you remember one of the yes sorry um okay uh yes uh okay good question i mean here we can um we can also think about discrete system it just then um then i guess you would only have translation by the increments of some um of some energy uh yeah, in this case, we take the continuous system because it's uh, it's kind of a good approximation uh, for what we're going to do, and um, you can always kind of reduce the this um, this example of the continuous system to the discrete system by just like taking like infinitely the levels which are infinitely close to each other. Does it make sense? Okay. Uh, so yeah, how are we going to prove the second law? If you remember from thermodynamics, one of the ways to formulate the second law is that um, there cannot exist a process. Uh, the only result of which would be um, the extraction of energy from, uh, from an object. So basically, translating it, translating it to here, is that there are going to be no protocol which extracts positive average uh, work from a thermal bath. So we want to prove. This such that uh, the only result is the extraction of work from a hot bath. How are we going to prove it? Uh, we're going to prove it by contradiction. So suppose that such protocol exists. Okay. So suppose that we're able to extract work, uh, and then we extract this work and store it in, in the weight. So the result of a protocol is such that the we increase the energy um, of the weight, the average energy of the weight. Uh, so in this case, how does the energy of the battery change? I'm oh, sorry, not the battery, the bath. Yes. No, please. It's okay. Okay. Yes. So yes, it should decrease because, uh, because, basically, again, remember at the what is the class of operations we are looking at? We are looking at the operations which uh, preserve the total energy of the system, which means that 
uh, the total change of the energy of both systems should be zero. Uh, which means that the energy of the bath is the opposite. It should decrease. Okay, that's the first step. Uh, so now the next the next question I'm going to ask is: Let us consider the now the entropy change during the same protocol. Um, during which we supposedly are able to um, to extract some work and store it in the weight. Uh, so what is the total change of entropy in this process? Yes, exactly, as we had before. Because again, the process we're considering is a unitary and it doesn't change the entropy. And uh, what can you then say about um, the sum of individual entropies? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, is it clear why this is positive? This is again due to the sub-additivity of entropy. Uh, okay, now a more difficult question. So, uh, what is the change? Um, what is the change of entropy uh, of the bath? Sorry, yes, of the bath. What is the change of entropy of the bath? Is it bigger than zero or is it lower than zero? Lower, okay, why? Um, okay, the, the answer is correct that indeed the change of entropy of the bath is uh, less than zero. Um, yeah, one, indeed because we decrease the energy, but also because um, important argument here as well, that the initial state of the bath is thermal, which is the state of the maximal entropy with the, with, the, um, with the given average energy, which means that when we decrease the average energy, the entropy can only decrease. It cannot uh, increase. So, okay. Uh, so basically what we, what we have is delta SV minus modulus delta SB should be bigger or equal than zero. So if such process exists, then the change of the entropy of the weight should be bigger or equal than the change of the entropy of the bath. However, next, the next step in the argument is that this in fact is not possible. Because we can always construct um, um, the initial state of the weight such that we can make the delta SV as small as possible. And this will only depend on the initial, uh, on the parameter of the initial state of the weight. Which means that uh, this inequality will then not hold. And then by contradiction, uh, by finding such a state, we'll get that our initial assumption was incorrect. Uh, so then contradiction. Okay. Uh, which state do we choose? You already saw the state in the lecture. So an easy way to describe the state, we label it as psi L um, of the weight is say the integral dE 
psi L of E, E on the weight. And the wave function would be like this um, rectangle, basically. One over square root of L if modulus E is less or equal than L and zero Ls. So basically the idea here is that indeed, say this is psi squared, uh, and this is E, this is minus square root of L, oh sorry, this is minus L, this is plus L. So the idea here is that the, the initial state of the weight is spread over, over, over as many energies as we want. Uh, and in the limit, as L goes to infinity, it just spreads over the whole plane. And in that case, um, because basically what would happen during the protocol, it just like we shift these energy, um, these energy levels in the weight. And then if initially the weight was spread over as many energies as possible, or a lot of energies, um, these shifts will not change the overall state much. And so the, uh, because it would shift just somewhere where there was already some, a bit of population and so on. And uh, this will mean that um, the change, the total net change of entropy of the state uh, would be very small. All right, this is an intuitive argument, a mathematical argument, which uh, we briefly have to go through, is a bit more involved. So let me see. Uh, again, I just sketch it. Uh, there should be enough hints in the in the exercise sheet, but let me just quickly draft it and then we can finish. How do we show it formally that indeed the change of en in entropy is small? So uh, the first thing that we argue is that after, so the initial state of the weight is the sphere state. Uh, the final state of the weight can be written out generally as just like sum over um, all uh, energy um, translations. So depending on what, uh, what is the other system we use, like the i and j range to some dimension d, uh, but just the general way to write the state is uh, phi i g, which is the probability of, of the energy translation. And then we just translate by the difference of energies of EI and EJ. And here's the Hermitian conjugate. Uh, yeah. So we are not like concerned what it, with what is the actual protocol we just uh, we just know that in the end the weight the state of the weight will be written uh, in this form. Uh, then what we have to use is so-called fans inequality. Uh, 
this is a very useful inequality for the uh, for for the entropy, the, so the entropies of the system, uh, which I will not prove um, now. But basically, for example, if you're going to work on entropies and entropy relations in the future, uh, this you will you will encounter this almost everywhere. So the change of the entropy of the weight is less or equal than d log d squared over d, where d, small d is just the dimensions of the system, systems which are used in, uh, in this protocol, and d is the trace distance between um, the initial and the final state of the weight. Um, thankfully, due to this form of the final state of the weight, uh, we don't need to use the actual um, definition of the trace distance for the states because that would be a bit painful. Uh, what we need to use to, um, to see, um, to calculate the, this trace distance is basically that's the trace distance, first it's convex. So the trace distance of the sum, probabilistic sum over rho i's and sigma is less or equal than sum over i's p i uh, trace distance between rho i and sigma. And this basically allows us to just reduce um, the trace distance between this state and this state into the sum, probabilistic sum of the trace distance between this state and this state. And you can see that both of these states are pure. And in that case, the trace distance um, can be written as square root of one minus the fidelity uh, in this case, which is psi uh, p squared and square root. And by using this, you can um, you can you can find out that the trace distance can be bounded by the following. Kind of maximal energy uh, translation. So, in some sense, we just see by um, kind of how far, what is the farthest energy translation here during the protocol and over to L. So, I'm not entirely sure about this factor two here. So the original paper from which I adapted this exercise didn't have that factor, but when I was deriving this, I got this factor. So maybe I'm wrong, maybe they're wrong. Just let me know if you're, I'll have problems with that factor. So this was just like to show um, that if we ban bind the, um, this trace distance by uh, by this value, which depends on L, which is entirely the way we construct uh, the initial state of the weight. Then we see that if we look at that um, at, uh, at this expression and input D there, uh, basically what we will get is that this expression. Let's forget about logarithm. Uh, would be proportional to one over uh, square root of L. So if we choose L large enough, this, this will be small enough. That's the idea. Uh, and that's this kind of seals this argument mathematically. Okay, I believe uh, I'm out of time. So uh, if you have any questions,
please ask them now um, or later or write me. And thank you for attending. <laughs>